Welcome to 3ABN's Fall Camp Meeting Homecoming 2011. Featuring inspired messages from your 3ABN family. And special guest speaker, Mark Finley. All to prepare your heart for the coming of the Lord. We've had one beautiful day today. We have. Amen. Yes, All have. people said. Amen. All right. All right. It wasn't so beautiful outside. Um, I was a day late on my rain uh, prediction. Yeah. yeah, but it's beautiful now. I saw a beautiful golden sunset. Oh, ago. Uh, and mm -hmm. I was inside, so I missed that. But yeah. it has been a beautiful day inside. And we have enjoyed the blessings of God all day long. It's just really been a feast, a little foretaste of heaven. And uh, Elder Bradford just led us to the throne again a few moments ago. He did. And when we just went off the air, if you're watching, Jim and I and John and C.A. was out here, and we think he was still preaching out back when yeah, he left there. Right. So we he have might him on the front row there now. There he is. Now he's back, to, back here again. He <laughs> may get up and preach some more later. That's right. That's, That's right. right. Praise but the Lord. he did Lord. a great job. Now we have Pastor Mark Finley. Yes. And uh, he's assistant to the president of the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mark is a longtime friend and uh, been in ministry for many, many years and had uh, numerous positions within the church. And uh, we're just thankful that we, in fact, we just had meetings with him ourselves. And yes. Trying to work together uh, for the big, uh, it's an evangelistic crusade in New York City this coming year. You'll hear a lot about it. But we need every hand and every person. We need people praying, people giving financially, people, you know, actually volunteers. Right. And it's going to be a huge crusade and hundreds of meetings going on throughout New York City. And 3ABN is uh, going to be part of many other ministries joining hands uh, with the church to make this happen and uh, the end result will be souls for the kingdom but we appreciate mark and what he does and his uh, tremendous commitment to the cause of god not only the adventist church but the cause of god and what he's done worldwide absolutely i've known him for many years he's probably the hardest working or one of the hardest most hard working individuals that i have ever known and uh, he really works for the Lord. And uh, the Lord has blessed his evangelism all over the world. Uh, for many years, the speaker of it has written. But at the same time, he wasn't just in a studio preaching. He was out there holding evangelistic meetings in some really difficult places around the world. Mm -hmm. And so God has blessed him. And we're going to ask him to come now. And uh, he is going to introduce the music that we have for this particular program. Pastor Mark Finley. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Danny. In a little while, we're going home. It was 31 AD. And the disciples believed with all their hearts, based on the prophecies of the Old Testament, that Jesus was going to come and set up his throne. They saw Jesus touch the eyes of the blind and they were open. They saw Jesus touch the ears of the deaf and they were unstopped. They believed that Christ could lead the disciples and the armies of Israel against Rome. And even right up to the crucifixion, the disciples had no idea that Jesus was not going to establish his, his earthly kingdom. In fact, for every prophecy in the Old Testament that these disciples studied on the first coming of Christ, there are eight prophecies on the second coming of Christ. So when Jesus was crucified, the disciples were bitterly disappointed out of the disappointment of 31 AD. They looked to the sanctuary and there received the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and out of their disappointment, they went out to preach the gospel to the world. Fast forward 2,000 years almost. In the early 1800s, William Miller and others began to study the prophecies. And like these disciples in Jesus' day, they too misunderstood the prophecies. Like these disciples in Jesus' day, they thought Christ was going to come to earth in 1844. He was, they were bitterly disappointed. Shortly after that disappointment, William Miller wrote a letter to his friend Joshua V. Hyams. And this is what Miller said. He said, I fixed my mind on another time. And here I mean to stand until God gives me more light. 
and that other time is today and today and today until he comes and I can almost hear the old man saying and I shall see him for whom my soul yearns tonight with you I look forward to the coming of Christ and my soul yearns for his coming listen as Reggie comes and sings an anthem of William Miller's words I fixed my mind on another time I have fixed my mind on another time, on another time. And here I mean to stand until God gives me more light. And that Today until he comes I have fixed my mind On another time On another time I have set my course On the narrow way on the narrow way For I know the time is close at hand For which I watch and pray And that is today, today, today until he I have set my course on the narrow way, on the narrow way. Even so, Lord, come quickly. This is my fervent prayer, for I've called.
I have set my mind on another time, and that is today, today, today. Let's pray. Father, as we open your word tonight, may the spirit that inspired the word come and touch our hearts. May the spirit that spoke to prophets in ages old speak to our hearts. May the spirit that speaks to our hearts every day, drawing us out to sense that this world is not our home, may that spirit heavily rest upon us tonight and touch us and change us. In Christ's name, amen. It was just at the end of Sabbath school, and the teacher was letting the children, seven, eight, nine years old, go back into the main sanctuary. And she thought she had ought to give them a little caution. So she said, children, when you go back into the sanctuary, walk very quietly and don't say anything. Children, do you know why you have to go back into the sanctuary so quietly? One little girl, seven years old, raised her hand and said, Oh, yes, teacher, because so many people are sleeping in there. <laughs> Take your Bible, please, and turn to Revelation, the third chapter. My topic tonight is the Laodicean message. Revelation chapter 3. If it wasn't so tragic, it would be funny. Revelation, the third chapter. We're looking at Revelation chapter 3, and we be are beginning with the 14th verse. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 14. The Laodicean message is, in, is the last in a series of messages that God gave to seven churches. Now keep in mind that these were seven literal geographical locations. There was Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamos and Thyatira and Sardis and Philadelphia and Laodicea. The book of Revelation describes the spiritual condition of seven literal churches that existed in John's day. The reason why God chose those particularly seven verses is because, or those seven churches rather, is because those seven churches re would represent the church down through the stream of time in, in seven specific epochs of time. So the spiritual condition of Ephesus, the spiritual condition of Smyrna and Thyatira and Sardis, and the spiritual condition of Pergamos and Philadelphia and Laodicea would all be represented in those seven ages down through the stream of time. In Revelation chapter 3 we begin into the angel of the church of Laodiceans write, where was Laodicea? What can we learn from the spiritual condition of that church in Laodicea that would apply to the church today? Well, the first thing we notice is that Laodicea is the last in the series of seven churches, so it obviously would speak to the last generation of Christians living upon the earth, and particularly if Laodicea is a church, the message would speak to God's last day church from the context of the passage. The second thing that we would notice about it is this, the meaning of the word Laodicea. Now, I often ask many audiences, what does the word Laodicea mean? And typically, I do not get the right response, but I know this is a well-educated audience at 3ABN, and I know the audience working on television is well-educated. The word Laodicea, do you have any idea what does that mean? Oh, I... <laughs> The condition is lukewarm, but the word does not mean lukewarm. The word means a people adjudged. A literal translation of the word Laodicea is a people adjudged. So Laodicea is the last church. It is the church in the judgment hour just before Jesus comes, and its condition is lukewarm. Where was Laodicea? Laodicea was in southwest Turkey. I visited the site on many, many, many occasions. When I first began to visit Laodicea, it was a very pure virgin site. In other words, it wasn't excavated yet. And it was marvelous. We'd tramp up on the site, and quite a large site. Laodicea was a city that had a population of about 150,000. Do you know how we evaluate the population base of the ancient cities? If you take the stadium in the city, and we can excavate 
archaeologists have excavated the stadium. If you take the stadium and you take the population, of the, the number of people that could be seated in the stadium and multiply it by 10, that's approximately the population size of the city. So the stadium in Laodicea might seat 10, 12,000. You might be able to cram in more. But we estimate the population between 120 and 150,000 roughly in Laodicea. So this was no backwater city. It was no backwater town. In fact, Laodicea was a banking capital. It was extremely wealthy. Gold coins were distributed from Laodicea. It was a city that was, was wealth, had a lot of wealth. Laodicea was destroyed by an earthquake in 61 AD, AD 61. When Laodicea was destroyed, the Roman government, because Laodicea was a very uh, city that was loyal to Rome, the Roman government said, we will help you rebuild your city. And the Laodiceans said, forget it. We've got enough money to rebuild the city ourselves." Tacitus, the very famed Roman historian, writes about Laodicea, and this is what he says. Laodicea arose from its ruins by the strength of her own resources and with no help from us. See, that's Laodicea. It's wealthy. It's proud. It's affluent. We don't need anybody to help us. Second thing about Laodicea. Laodicea had a special type of wool found only there in the world, really. It was a very unique kind of wool. It, they bred a, a, a black sheep, and they had hundreds, thousands of these black sheep, and if you shear them, the wool was very glossy. And the women were really attracted to these black garments. They produced at least four kinds of these black gar garments, and they shipped them all over the world. They exported them. So Laodicea was this fashion center. If you wanted to buy the latest in fashion, particularly these very finely woven, beautiful black garments, you go to Laodicea. The third thing about Laodicea is that Laodicea had a medical center. It was an educational medical center. They developed the very famous uh, Pergam Isav. And uh, the salve came either in a powder form that you mixed liquid with, or it came in a tablet form, and it was exported all over the world. Somebody has said, Laodicea was like the Bank of America, Macy's, and um, one other one, Bank of America, Macy's, and the Mayo Clinic, all rolled in one. That was it. Bank of America, Macy's, Mayo Clinic. I mean, Laodicea was just this fantastic city. It was a city of pride and affluence, a city that was self-sufficient, a city that believed that it needed nothing else from nobody else. God chose that city. Now, what was the church like in Laodicea? Do we have any description in the New Testament at all that helps us know the spiritual condition of the local congregation in this secular, godless, materialistic, educated culture. Do we have any at all? We do. If you take your Bible, please, and turn to the book of Colossians. Now, Colossia wasn't too far from Laodicea. And Paul actually wrote a, a letter to Colossia, and according to the book of Colossians, he also wrote a letter to the Laodiceans, which eventually was lost. But we get a hint of the spiritual condition of the church at both Colossia and Laodicea from Paul's writing. He writes to Colossia, and he says to the church at Colossians, chapter 2, send my letter from the, that I've written to the Colossians, send that also to the church at Laodicea. So let them read it. In Colossians 2, verse 1, Paul talks about the trouble in his soul. Paul talks about his spiritual anxiety. Paul talks about the fact that he is a spiritual father and he's really worried about the church at Laodicea. Colossians 2 verse 1, For I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea, for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh and their hearts may be encouraged being knit together in love and attaining to all the riches of the full assurance of the understanding to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now, don't miss the last part of verse 1, chapter 2. He says, I have a conflict with you. I'm troubled in my soul for you and for those in Laodicea. In other words, 
he looked at the church at Laodicea, and he had gotten reports about that church. And he got reports that the church at Laodicea was rich, it was cultured, it had a form of godliness, it was apathetic, it was sentimental spirituality. They had not denied the gospel, they had not denied Christ, but this church at Laodicea had the form of godliness. They honored God with their lips, but their hearts were far from Him. That was the literal church at Laodicea. And so Jesus addresses that church. Revelation chapter 3, what an apt description of the church living at the judgment hour. A church that is proud of her accomplishments, many of them it should be. A church that is proud of its institutions. A church that is proud of its worldwide membership. A people that are proud of their doctrines, that they're doctrinally right. But Jesus addresses a special letter to them, the letter to the Laodiceans. Let's read it. Revelation 3, and to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, these things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. It is so easy to skip over verses that are so fraught with meaning. It is so easy to skip over verses that speak to our hearts. Now let's look at these four descriptions of Jesus. He is the amen. When do you place amen in a prayer? At the end of prayer. So the church at the judgment hour is being addressed by the amen at the end of human history. This is the last church because after Laodicea, there is an amen. There is no such thing as the remnant of the remnant. Does somebody hear me tonight? There is no calling out of Laodicea for another remnant to arise. There is the message to Laodicea that brings revival in Laodicea. Amen. He that has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. If God says amen after Laodicea, it's amen. At the end of human history, God will have a church. The amen, the faithful and true witness. His witness is faithful and it's true. We may want to avoid it. We may not want to accept it. It may make us uncomfortable and squirm in the pew, but it's still true. Pastor Finley, I'm so glad you're preaching the Laodicean message. Those brethren need it. I'm so glad. I can't wait to get this tape to show it to my local church because they're not 3ABN fans and they really need this one. That attitude defines what a Laodicean is all about. Laodicea applies the Laodicean message to somebody else that everybody needs it except me. The Scripture says, Revelation chapter 3, these things say the amen, the end of history, the faithful and true witness. Jesus is witnessing to my heart tonight. Jesus is witnessing to your heart tonight. His witness is faithful about me. His witness is faithful about you. He is the faithful and true witness. Now notice, He's the beginning of the creation of God. Now that strange expression, he's the beginning of the creation of God. What does that mean, that God created Jesus first? Not at all. In the Greek language, there are, the word for beginning here is the Greek word arche, and it means beginner or first cause, that Jesus started all creation. Keep your finger in Revelation chapter 3, go back to Ephesians 3 verse 9. Ephesians 3 verse 9, who is the one that addresses the church at Laodicea? Ephesians 3, verse 9. And to make all people see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ. Jesus is the beginning of the creation of God in the sense that He is the beginner of the creation of God. 
He is the one that brought forth all creation. He spoke and it was done. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And all things are created by Him, and in Him and by Him all things are created and exist. So it is the Almighty Creator that brought light out of darkness that speaks to Laodicea. It is the Almighty Creator that hung every star in space and caused the planets to revolve around the sun. It's the Almighty Creator that said to the tides, you come hither and go no further. It is the Almighty Creator that brought life on this earth that speaks to Laodicea and says, I can recreate your hearts. I can bring light out of the darkness of your mind. I can turn the form of godliness so that you'll have a new beating spiritual heart. It is the Creator that speaks to Laodicea. So the Laodicean message is full of encouragement. It's full of hope because Jesus, the Creator, says, I can recreate my image in His people, in my people. Now listen, here's the faith I live by, page 306. The counsel of the true witness, the prophet to the remnant says this, the counsel of the true witness. What is that, the counsel of the true witness? What's that? The Laodicean message is full of encouragement and comfort. The churches may yet obtain the gold of true faith and love and be rich in the blessings in the, in the heavenly treasure. The message to the Laodiceans is full of courage and comfort. If you think tonight that the Laodicean message is one that God has given to whip His people and beat them so they feel so discouraged, you miss missed the whole point. Tonight, as we study the latest in message, I want to show you how full of encouragement it is for you. There's somebody watching tonight. You just happen to tune in. And you've got a formal religious experience. Your prayers don't go any higher than the ceiling. You rarely study the Bible. God's going to speak to you tonight. God's going to touch you tonight. Jesus is going to break through. There's somebody here tonight. God sent you to this meeting for a purpose. You may have come into this meeting tonight knowing that there are things in your heart that are not right with God. Sure, you're a Sabbath-keeping, tithe-paying, health-reforming Adventist, but you know in your heart that you've lost something, that you're missing something, that there's a void in your heart, that the fire in your soul once burned was not there. You know you have to force yourself to get on your knees to pray, and then you're on there for about 30 seconds, and uh, your mind wanders, and you have a very superficial prayer life. You know that, oh sure, you love to watch speakers on television and get their, your religious teachings secondhand, but as far as opening the Bible yourself and listening to Jesus speak to you and let your heart be warmed, you know that those were days past. You know that your religious experience with Jesus has become quite apathetic and quite superficial and that you have a form of godliness, that you believe the doctrines, but you're missing something inside. Tonight, Jesus is going to speak to you. Tonight, Jesus is going to touch you. Tonight, your heart is going to be warmed in some amazing new ways as God from the text speaks to your heart. Take your Bible, please. The true witness is speaking, the one who can recreate our hearts. He says, I know your works, that you were neither cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot, so then because of you are lukewarm, indifferent, apathetic, and neither cold or hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. Notice. Jesus says to Laodicea, you've taken a bath in lukewarm water. The water in Laodicea was very lukewarm. You go and visit there today, and you look across the valley to Hierapolis, and you see the hot springs coming up out of Hierapolis, and they come across about six miles. You can still see the ruins of the Roman aqueducts, and they were hot. The water was hot when it came out of the springs, but by the time it got to Laodicea, it was uh, lukewarm, and uh, it was nauseating. So the church at Laodicea had taken a bath in lukewarm water. It was not hot, it was not on fire for God, but it was not cold, it had not rejected truth. So Jesus says, I, because you say I'm rich and have become wealthy, you are doctrinally wealthy, you are spiritually wealthy from the sense of doctrine, but you have need of nothing, but you don't know that you're wretched, you're miserable, you're poor, you're blind, and you're naked. Laodicea said, I'm rich. Jesus said, you're poor. Laodicea said, I'm a banking capital. And Jesus said, you're poor. Laodicea said, I am clothed with the garments 
Look at our garments. Look at our fashion. Jesus said, you're naked. Laodicea said, I can see we produce this eye salve. Jesus said, you're blind. And then Jesus makes this offer. The heavenly merchant man comes and knocks on the door of Laodicea. He knocks on the door of your heart. He knocks on the door of my heart tonight. What does Jesus offer and what does it mean? Jesus says, I counsel you. The true witness is speaking. He's speaking to you. He's speaking to me. If you are here in this 3AB in the audience, the true witness is speaking to you. The heavenly merchant man is speaking to you. If you're watching by television, Jesus is speaking to you. I counsel you to buy of me gold tried in the fire. We stop there. What is the gold tried in the fire that Laodicea does not have that Christ appeals to us to get? What is that? Let's let the Bible tell us. First, we go to Peter. Take your Bible, please, and come to Peter with me. The first chapter of Peter. First Peter chapter 1, verse 7. First Peter chapter 1, verse 7. What is the gold tried in the fire? The gold that Laodicea needs. Laodicea needs more than a form of godliness. Laodicea needs more than to honor Christ with her lips. Laodicea needs more than a doctrinal correctness. Laodicea needs more than simply an external label. Laodicea needs the gold tried in the fire. Gold is precious. 1 Peter chapter 1, we look there, verse 7, that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So the gold is the preciousness of your faith. What is faith? Faith is trusting God as a friend well known. How do you develop faith? Romans chapter 10 verse 17 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the what? Word of God. So when Jesus, the heavenly merchant man, invites us to take the gold, he's inviting us to develop a faith that will stand the crisis of times. He's, develop, he's inviting us to enter into a study of his word personally, practically, and let the word of God transform our lives to develop a deep relationship of faith with him. Look at what Peter says after he talks about this gold tried in the fire, this, this faith, he says, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God which lives and abides forever. How is it that when we drift into Laodicean complacency, we can be born again? How is it that as our experience with Jesus becomes apathetic, our hearts can be changed, that we can be moved from being indifferent? Peter tells us, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God. Second Peter. What is it that will bring revival to God's people? What is it that will transform the Laodicean spiritual experience? It is, it is as men and women on their knees open God's Word and allow the precious promises of God's Word to transform their life. There is nothing that substitutes in the Christian life for taking time with Jesus in His Word. You cannot be a solid, vibrant, committed, Christian, unless the Word of God transforms your life and changes your mind. We are not conformed to this world, but we are transformed by the renewing of our minds, 2 Peter chapter 1. Notice he says, 2 Peter chapter 1, by which, verse 4, have been given to us exceeding great and precious, what? Promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption of the world, that is through lust. We escape the corruption of the world and are partakers of the divine nature as we fill our mind with God's Word. Listen to what James says, James chapter 1. There is a danger. The danger is that we substitute listening to sermons 
on DVD to listening to the voice of God in His Word. I thank God for the media ministries. I thank God for 3ABN. I thank God for Hope Channel. I thank God for every Adventist ministry, all of them, breath of life. Praise God for it. It is written, praise God for it. Amazing facts, praise God for it. But if you think that you're going to develop a deep spiritual experience by becoming a religious groupie and following your favorite TV preacher, be it Mark Finley or anybody else, that will not provide the depth that God wants you to have. The answer to Laodicea is found in the Word of God, the book of James. There is no substitute for opening God's Word. There is no substitute for letting God speak to you through His book. There is no substitute for the transformation of character that comes. The gold tried in the fire is the development of the faith through a mind immersed in the Word of the living God. James chapter 1 verse looking there in the book of James chapter 20 chapter 1 verse 21 therefore lay aside all filthiness and the overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls the implanted word i love that expression has the word of god been implanted in your mind has the Word of God saturated your consciousness? Has the Word of God molded and shaped your thinking and transformed your life? Amen. Revival, genuine, authentic revival will not come to this church simply because there's some music that makes you want to clap your hands. That may lead to false revival. A false revival is going to come it's going to be based on emotionalism and sentimentalism. And for a people that are not used to disciplined study of God's Word and that want a quick fix in religion, that want a candy-coated, sugar-coated gospel that makes them feel good, the devil will provide a counterfeit. Shallow calls to shallow, but deep calleth to deep. I do not call you tonight to a shallow, superficial, easygoing, crossless Christian experience. Tonight I call you to the depths of God's Word. I call you to fill your mind, for it is written, none but those who have fortified their minds with the teaching of Scripture, and I quote, will, live through, will, live through the, will stand through the final crisis. Revival comes through saturating our minds with the Word of God. This is what Jesus is talking about to Laodicea. The faith, the gold, the Christian experience that comes through God's Word. Psalm 119. What is the source of revival? What is the very heart of revival? What is the very essence of revival? Psalm 119. And we look there in the 119th Psalm. In the 107th verse. Let's look at verse 105, 106, 107. Psalm 119, 105, 106, and 107. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I've sworn and confirmed that I'll keep your righteous judgments. I am afflicted much. Revive me, O Lord, according to your what, everybody? Revive me, O Lord, according to what? Your word. What is the source in the heart of revival? Revival comes as we pray over God's Word. Do you see why the Laodicean message is full of, as the prophet of God to the remembrance says, hope and encouragement? Because as we fill our minds with God's Word, the same Holy Spirit that inspired the Bible inspires our hearts. The Creator God who spoke and it was done, who commanded and it stood fast, the creative energy, and I quote again, the creative energy that brought worlds into existence is in the Word of God. 
The same Jesus who spoke worlds into his existence speaks to us through his word, and our lives are transformed through the very word of God. Back to Revelation chapter 3. What does the heavenly merchant man invite us to do? First, he comes knocking on the door of your heart, and he says, will you give me time? Will you give me time? Revelation chapter 3. Will you give me time to build, up you, build within you a faith? Will you give me time to build within you a strength of character? Will you spend time every day allowing me to speak to you from my word? Revelation 3. I counsel you to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that you may be rich, and white raiments that you may be clothed. What are these white raiments? Well, Revelation chapter 19, take your Bible there, Revelation chapter 19, and you're going to look at Revelation chapter 19, and you're going to look at verse 9, Revelation chapter 19, verse 9. What is this white raiment? Revelation chapter 19, verse 9, describes what this white raiment is. Revelation 19, verse 9. We'll start with verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give Him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and His wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. What is, the, what is this white raiment? It is Jesus' righteousness that transforms our lives. What is Jesus saying when he says, come to me and receive this white raiment? He's saying, bathe your mind in an understanding of my grace and my righteousness. You are frail and weak and sinful, and all your righteousness is as filthy rags. Even your righteous acts are tainted by selfish motives. But come to me, immerse yourself in me, I love that old hymn, not I but Christ, be honored, loved, exalted. Not I but Christ, be seen, be known, be heard. Not I but Christ in every look and action. Not I but Christ in every deed and word. Jesus has come and allow me to fill your heart. Come and allow me to change your life. Come and allow me to be your Savior, your Lord. Come and allow me to transform you and make you over again. Drink deeply of my grace and my love and my salvation. Jesus says to you and to me tonight, spend time immersing your mind in my grace, thy goodness, my righteousness. Dwayne L. Moody once said, the man the world has yet to see, that man, that woman, who is totally consecrated to God, I will be that man. Do you hear the call to God to your heart? I will be that man. I will be that woman. Lord, all I want is to reflect your love. All I want is to reflect your grace. All I want is your grace to flow out of me. I want to reveal Jesus in kindness and compassion and gentleness. I know, Lord, there's no goodness in me. I know that there is no way that my righteousness can save me. Nobody else has to tell me how wicked I am because I know this man's heart. I know this man's mind. Nothing in my hand I bring. Only to his cross I cling. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed and so happy in Jesus. Laodicea, an appeal to the cross, an appeal to kneel before him and praise him for his righteousness and his goodness and his love. What is the message to Laodicea? Revelation chapter 3. It is a message to develop faith and strength of character through his word. It is a message to be immersed in his love and allow his grace and righteousness and goodness to transform your life. The last part of the verse says, 
that you may be clothed, verse chapter 3, verse 18, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. Without Jesus and His righteousness clothing me, the x-ray of the divine eyes of eternity see through my fig leaf garments of works, and I and I'm seen as naked before God. But as I fall on my knees and say, Jesus, I'm a sinner, but you are altogether righteous. Clothe me with your righteousness, Lord. Clothe me with your righteousness. Transform my life through that righteousness. As a sinner, I am declared righteous through the righteous life of Christ. Amen. But as a sinner, the, the faith that receives His justifying grace is the same faith that receives His sanctifying power. The same faith that receives justification for my past and present failures who receives His power in sanctification to transform me. Amen. Salvation comes as I spend time with Jesus in His Word. It comes as I cast my helpless soul upon Him and let Him clothe me with His beautiful robe of righteousness. And He declares me before the universe is righteous. And that which He declares me to be, He promises to me that He's not only the author, but He is the finisher of our faith. He promises me that if I stay with Him and don't drop out of the school of Christ, that He will get me through. Because He which hath begun a good work in you, Philippians 1 verse 6, will finish it. I'm not all that I want to be, but I, am, I will be all I can be through the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He surrounds me and clothes me with His righteousness and works in me through His grace and power to transform me. So as John says, behold, behold, now are we the sons of God, but we do not yet know what we shall be. But we know this, that we shall be like Him because when He appears, we shall see Him as He is. Jesus is taking Laodicea, whom he has clothed with his righteousness, transforming their hearts to make him, make them loving, kind people to be a witness to the world. This is the message of Laodicea. Let Jesus do a deep work in your heart. Let Jesus finish the work in your heart that he began. Let Jesus be not only the author, but the finisher of your faith. Revelation chapter 3, last part of verse 18. And anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. What is the eye salve? It is the Holy Spirit bringing us to conviction of who we are. It's the Holy Spirit showing us our need of Jesus Christ. Oh, Jesus, I don't want to be so rushed even in my ministry that I miss receiving the gold and that the faith and strength of character is not developed in me to stand in the final crisis. I don't want to be so clothed in the accomplishments of my works that I don't kneel before you and receive your grace. Lord, I don't want to be so blind that I don't see my nature that drives me to Jesus. And Jesus says, Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and sup with him and he with me. In the Eastern world, supper was a meal that you sat down in fellowship. You don't run by. Jesus says, I'm standing at the door and knock. Can I come in? Can I come in? I'm standing there at that door and knocking. Will you make a total, complete surrender of your life to me? Will you allow me to fill that aching void in your soul? You're an Adventist. You're a tithe-paying, Sabbath-keeping, health-reforming Adventist, but you're running through life. And deep down in your soul, there is an aching for a genuine spirituality. You are saying, God, there must be something more. And Jesus says to you, come, come, open your heart. Let me change your life. I want to read you a remarkable letter. This letter was written 
about 40 years ago. It was written, in fact, 1968-1970. A group of communist infiltrators came to America. They began working on college campuses. And a communist, I will say evangelist, converted to communism a number of American young people. One of the young men that accepted communism in the late 60s when communism was in its heyday, he believed in the ideology of communism, that the classless society that Marx had offered was the way forward for all the world. This young man who had been a Christian left Christianity and he had been dating a Christian girl and he broke up with her. I want to read you a copy of the letter that he wrote to his Christian girlfriend and why as a communist he had to break up with a Christian, why they couldn't date. My dear, I'm writing this letter to inform you that I can no longer continue our relationship. I have become a communist and must sacrifice everything for my commitment to the cause. We communists don't have time for fine cars and luxurious houses and movies and T-bone steaks or fancy clothes. We are all consumed by the cause of communism. Communism is my love. It is my mistress. It is my sweetheart. It consumes my time and absorbs my thoughts. Its hold on me grows stronger, not weaker, every day. I give back to the cause every penny, except for my living expenses, and I'm willing to give up my life for the cause of communism. Therefore, I can have no relationship that is contrary to the cause, and we must break up. When I read that, I said, Oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus, how pathetic my commitment to you is at times. How superficial. Jesus, you are the great creator. Come and recreate my heart. Come and transform my life. Come and make me like you. Do you hear God speaking to you tonight? Is God speaking to your heart? Is there the call to something deeper? Is there the call to spend time with him in prayer? Is there the call to spend time in his book? Is there the call to your heart to a deeper surrender tonight? Would you like to bow your heads with me as we pray? If there's somebody here that you know God is calling you to make a change in your life, I don't know what that change is, but you hear his voice speaking to you tonight. Somebody watching by television God is calling you tonight to make that change. Would you just raise your hand right now? Lord, I need a change. Lord, I need a change. Lord, I need to be anchored in your word. Lord, I want to be ready when you come. Jesus, thank you for being the great creator that will change our hearts. Oh, my Father, thank you that the message of the Laodiceans is so full of hope and encouragement. You have not spewn us out of your mouth. You will create a mighty revival, and the winds of revival are blowing. Oh, Jesus, tonight... We open our hearts to you. Come and fill them with your power, your strength, your goodness, your righteousness. And use us in your closing work. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Go tonight knowing. Go tonight knowing that you are Christ's and he is yours. Amen. amen. Thank you, Mark. And all the people said it once again. Amen. Amen. Wow. We've had a wonderful time. We want to thank all of you for coming, those of you at home, for um, staying with us at camp meeting. Many of you are watching from around the world. And uh, this is a, a spiritual time. It's for, for revival and reformation. And uh, it's good for all of us. And though we're in the business of ministry, we need to be in the business of coming to Jesus every day, right? That's right. Coming to the foot of the cross. And sometimes a lot of us are out speaking. And it's great to be able to sit down and be fed by other folk. Hey, Amen. You know, we will have another camp meeting in the spring. And those dates are May 30, 31, June 1 and 2. 
And uh, so we're looking forward to that. Put it on your calendar and plan to be with us. You know the amazing thing, Danny, there are more people here at the end of this message than there were at the beginning. <laughs> and uh, they just yeah. kept coming back in. And uh, I always say when I go to churches on weekends, I say most Adventists will miss the second coming by about 20 minutes. Yeah. Because that's about how late church starts at 7. By 7.15, there's quite a few there. And by 7.30, most everybody that's coming comes, you know. So. That's right. But uh, however late you came, we're glad that you came, and uh, for sure. Well, uh, and what we want to do is leave you with a blessing. Uh, because how many of you have to travel now? got quite a distance to travel. We want to pray traveling mercies over you. And our prayer, too, is that this word that has gone forth, not just for you here, but all of you uh, across the, the nation and throughout the world that have had this word, that have received so beautifully from Brother Bradford, have we not? And from Pastor Finley, that this word that has been planted in your heart, that it will be sealed out there by the power of the Holy Spirit, that the enemy can't come and steal not any of that word out of your heart, but that that word will be planted deeply within your heart, and it will produce not 30-fold, not 60-fold, but how many of you on a 100-fold return on this word that's gone into our heart today. So that's our prayer tonight for everyone that's here, for all of you around the world, that the power of the word will be planted deeply within your heart and that it will have a mighty return for the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. Jesus is coming soon. Amen. Good night. God bless you.